name's Richard Freeman. I work for an outfit called the Centre for Fortean Zoology, which is a unique organisation, and we study mysterious, strange and anomalous animals. Uh, I travel around the world searching for creatures like the Tasmanian wolf, a flesh-eating marsupial uh, that resembles a wolf but with the stripes of a tiger and is supposed to be extinct but no one's told the Tasmanian wolf because uh, there's been over 4,000 sightings of it. Other creatures like the giant anaconda, the yeti and many, many more. But one of my tr chief interests is dragons and I'm interested in the literal existence of dragons. All of the talks today have been about dragons as symbols or metaphors or allegories. In order to have uh, a metaphor, you have to have something to compare it with. You can't uh, liken something to something you don't know about. For instance, uh, you might say that someone is as strong as a lion or as fierce as a lion, but you have to have the lion to compare it to. So it is my contention that dragons are actual entities. And in this talk, um, I want to give you a quick introduction to the, some of the different types of dragon found around the world in different cultures. Obviously, I can't do all of them. I will be here all week. Uh, then I will have a quick look at what might be behind the dragon legends, what could have influenced uh, these cultures all over the world to believe in these creatures. And then finally, I'll, uh, I'll tell you about some of the modern day dragon sightings because surprisingly, there are quite a few claimed sightings of dragons in the modern age, particularly from Asia. And uh, I've talked to people all over the world who have encountered creatures whose descriptions are exactly the same on one side of the world to the other. So let's get started with various types of dragon. Now this is the true dragon, or western dragon, sometimes called the heraldic dragon. Uh, it's the most formidable of all of the dragons. And as you can see, it has four limbs, there are four legs, and two leathery bat-like wings. Now, uh, in many modern representations in Hollywood films, the lazy filmmakers don't give it these front limbs which technically makes it not a dragon at all, but a wyvern. Now this annoys me far, far more than it actually should. Uh, in fact, it makes me seethe with rage. I, I came out of um, Peter Jackson's artless, witless bastardization of The Hobbit with the veins in my head standing out. Every drawing Tolkien ever did of Smaug the Golden showed him with four legs and two wings. And he was golden, not that muddy brown. In the film, we're left with something that looks rather like a giant plucked turkey. <laughs> the best screen dragon that was actually in the, the BBC TV series Merlin. If you remember that, they actually got the dragon fairly accurate in that. Anyway, the most formidable of all, cre of, of all of the dragons. The dragons go back an incredible, incredible way into antiquity. Uh, the earliest representations of them are, are in France, in early cave paintings from about 25,000 years ago. But there is an anthropologist called Dr. Uh, Jamie Torini from um, uh, the University of Durham, and himself and his team have been studying the antiquity of legends and fairy tales. And they've done it in the way that biologists study animals and the relationships, evolutionary relationships between animals. They call it the phylogenetic tree in biology. And they've applied this to legends and fairy tales. And they found that some of the, the best known legends like uh, Sleeping Beauty and Rumpelstiltskin go back much further than we thought, thousands rather than hundreds of years. And there are legends all over the world of uh, a cosmic hunter pursuing an animal across the sky and the animal is bleeding and the blood becomes the stars. And this is found in many, many cultures and it goes back thousands and thousands of years. And he's traced the origins of the dragon legends back to Africa before modern man left Africa. Let that sink in a minute. Before we left Africa over 100,000 years ago. And these ancient African dragons were thought of as serpentine, horned, and living in and around water and having power over water. So remember water, that's the ancient element most linked with dragons. And we'll be coming back to that again and again and again. And echoes of these ancient dragons are found in, in more recent dragon mythology in Africa, in things like Inkanyamba, um, the sky dragon that brings rain, and Nyame Nyame, the dragon of Lake Kariba. 
but back to the Western Dragon. It uh, spat fire from its jaws. It had invulnerable scales. Uh, they were highly intelligent. They weren't just outsized flying lizards. Uh, many of them had magic powers. Uh, the, the green dragon of Long Witten could become invisible. Many of them could self-heal wounds. Uh, some of them were functionally immortal. And uh, a lot of them could shape change. And uh, the western dragon is invariable, invariably malevolent. Uh, it uh, laid waste to the countryside, uh, devoured men and animals. Uh, strangely, in British dragon legends, it very rarely hoards gold, and in a lot of them, there's no hero that comes and saves the day. The dragon just appears, terrifies a community, then disappears again, rather like reports of mod uh, modern day reports of, of mysterious animals who appear, terrorize a, a community, and then disappear again. Uh, when the dragon is slain, more often than not, it's uh, by a peasant rather than a nobleman, and, uh, or, or sometimes a whole community gets together to, to drive the dragon away. Let's take a look at another picture of a typical Western dragon. Now we have four legs, two wings, reptilian. All dragons are reptilian. They do not have mammalian features whatsoever. Now, that's a wyvern. See the difference? Only two legs and two wings. Wyverns were much smaller than dragons. Uh, some of them bore a scorpion-like sting in the end of the tail, and they were thought to bred... Um, uh, <coughs> spread plague and disease, so if there was an outbreak of plague, it was oftentimes blamed on the wyvern. But remember, two legs for a wyvern, four legs for a dragon. Another very common uh, dragon or dragon-like creature in the UK is the worm, uh, called the orm in Germanic countries, or the lindorm in Scandinavian countries, and this was essentially an outsized serpent. It had no limbs whatsoever. It was a huge snake-like beast, and rather than breathing fire like a true dragon, it spat venom, or it belched great clouds of venomous gas. And uh, if it was hacked into pieces, it could join back together again. Uh, the the best-known uh, example is the Lampton Worm up uh, near Durham, which terrorised uh, terrorised the county in the 11th century until it was killed by Sir John Lampton. Uh, who fought the beast in the middle of the River Weir with uh, armour studded with uh, spearheads. So when the worm crawled about him, it impaled itself on, on these uh, spikes and John Lampton could hack it to pieces and the pieces were washed away by the current of the weir before they could grow back together again. In Scandinavia, where they're called lindorms, it was often thought that um, they would... Uh, grow from ordinary snakes and just get bigger and bigger and bigger until they lived in lakes to support their weight and then finally they get so huge that they would go out to sea and become sea serpents and they would be thought to coil around churches and crush them and the way to fight a, a lindorm in Scandinavia was to breed a giant bull and you would raise a bull by uh, feeding it nothing except milk so you would never wean it according to legend and the bull would get bigger and bigger until it was the size of an elephant then the two creatures would fight and the lindorm would often swallow the giant bull and get fatally stabbed by its horns internally and both creatures would die. The basilisk. Its name means little king and it was thought to be the lord of all serpents and basilisks occurred when a rooster's egg, not a hen's egg, a rooster's egg, was hatched by a toad or a snake. And the resulting monster was a small serpent, no, usually no more than a couple of feet long, but with a cockerel-like comb on its head and wattles. Uh, the creature was so deadly that any animal that looked at it would die instantly, except for the weasel, for some reason. Even the basilisk itself, if it caught sight of its own reflection, would die. Its breath was so venomous that it caused deserts wherever it went, because all the, the plants would shrivel all around it. In Exeter, there was a legend in the uh, <coughs> 17th century of uh, a basilisk having a residence in a, uh, a well uh, outside of the, um, the White Hart Inn. And it was supposed to have killed people by uh, its venomous breath until somebody managed to climb down into the well and slay it. The cockatrice, a creature very similar to the basilisk, except it's more avian. It looks rather like a uh, demented rooster 
with a, a dragon's tail. And once again, it had this deadly gaze. And it was somewhat bigger than the basilisk. It was, uh, they could grow to about the size of a fair-sized dog. And, and these creatures were turned up in medieval bestiaries with their, with their terrible withering gaze. And once again, they were vulnerable to the same things that uh, the basilisk was. Uh, it could be killed by being shown its own reflection. Or if it heard a rooster crowing at dawn, it would also die. The winged serpent, uh, on the continent, this is known as the Amphiptera. Uh, it has no legs but, but uh, a pair of wings and a deadly venomous bite. Uh, Herodotus was supposed to have seen uh, the bones of hundreds of these in the, the deserts of the Middle East. In Wales, they're called the Gwaiba, and it was thought that they grew from an ordinary snake that drunk a woman's milk. So if a woman was feeding her baby and some of her milk dropped down from her nipple onto the floor and a, a snake or a viper uh, drank it, it would become one of these huge winged serpents that would lay waste to the countryside and spit venom and, uh, and so forth. That's a very interesting uh, Welsh legend of uh, a young uh, uh, prince, and uh, when he was born, a soothsayer came to, came to the house and said that uh, he would die from the bite of a, uh, he would buy, die from the bite of a guaiba. So he was sent away to England, where there were no guaibas, and uh, <coughs> this guaiba that was laying waste to the countryside, uh, a local man dug a great pit and put a bronze mirror in it, and. Uh, <clears throat> the Gwaiba fell into the pit, saw its own reflection, and started fighting its own reflection until it was exhausted. And then the man jumped down and slew the Gwaiba. And uh, the skull was kept uh, for years and years and years. And the, young, the, the, uh, the child, now a young man, came back to Wales and was told the story and shown the, the skull of the Gwaiba. And he said, what a lot of nonsense, kicked the skull. And one of the fangs went into his foot and it had some res residual venom on it and he died. Moving away from Europe, we find um, a, a very different tradition in the Orient. Uh, this is a Chinese dragon, or long. Um, rather than being malevolent, they're generally, uh, generally kind, wise, and good creatures associated with rain and water, control over water and, uh, and rainfall. Rather than breathing fire, their breath condenses into, into rain and falls as rain. Uh, they have this long, sinuous form, and when, they're, when they first hatch, hatch out, their eggs were said to look like uh, gemstones, and when they hatch out, they resemble snakes, and there was the old um, adage, do not despise the snake because he has no horns, who to say, who's to say he will not one day become a dragon? And they go through a complex, um, very long life history. First of all, they grow, they grow to an immense size, but still looking like snakes. Then they get the crocodilian type head and the four legs, and then they get the branching antlers, and finally, in their rarest and most powerful form, they get wings. That's why we so, see wings so rarely on Asian dragons, is that they don't grow them until they're very, very ancient, and the wings will carry them through the heavens. <clears throat> this is the Tatsu, or Ryu, the Japanese dragon, whereas the Chinese dragon has five or, th or four claws, the Tatsu, the Japanese dragon, only has three. Once again, associated with water and rainfall. And <coughs> there's a, uh, a, a report from as late as um, the 19th century of Japanese fishermen at sea uh, during a thunderstorm, and this is held in the, in the Diet, the national records of, of Japan, of, uh, of the ship full of fishermen encountering a dragon and describing it as moving in great loops with its head held out of the water and it had this rough scaly skin they could see by the lightning that was flashing around it. <coughs> Another type of Asian dragon is the Naga. Now when you think of Nagas you might probably think of a creature with a human torso and a serpentine lower half. Well the original Naga was a massive snake with a fin or crest on the head. And it's probably a case of cultural cross-pollinization cross because the Naga, uh, in this form at least, emerged in Indochina and it's moved down uh, 
down into India and then through to Indonesia. And on the way, it's probably got cross-pollinated with other deities uh, and spirits. But the Naga itself is supposed to resemble a huge snake with this fin on its head. Uh, they were very like Asian dragons, uh, other Asian dragons. They, they had power over rainfall and water. They were supposed to be intelligent, generally benevolent, and living in deep uh, lakes and, uh, and rivers and seas. And way back in the year 2000, uh, I went with the Discovery Channel on an expedition to look at what might be lying behind the legends of the Naga, and uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later on. <clears throat> the Persian dragon is a bit of a strange half-breed. <clears throat> it resembles a Chinese or Japanese dragon, but it spits fire like a Western dragon, and it's generally aggressive and evil. Here we see the Islamic hero Rastam fighting the dragon. His miraculous horse saved his life when the dragon coiled about him and was about to devour him. The horse attacked the dragon and the dragon turned on the horse, allowing Rastam to get his sword out and plunge it into the softer scales on the underside of the, the dragon. But Persian dragons are very strange creatures and when they have wings, they tend to be feathery rather than bat-like. Um, which uh, other dragons generally have bat-like wings, but for some reason the Persian dragon has uh, these strange feathery wings, and sometimes they grow a sort of V-shaped crest on the head. So it's almost as if they're at a cultural crossroads between East and West. So, what is behind dragon legends? Dragon legends are found in every single culture on Earth. What I've just told you is the tip of the iceberg. Every culture has them. From the pygmies in the Congo with Michele and Bembe, <clears throat> to the ancient Egyptians, Quetzalcoatl in South America, um, the Mesoamerican snake deities, these monster reptiles appear everywhere. Even in, in very cold countries where there are no large reptiles. So what's behind them? One theory is the discovery of the bones of dinosaurs and <coughs> other large prehistoric animals. Here are some dinosaur bones. Now in China, these are still referred to as dragon bones. And in the cornucopia of um, Chinese medicine, it was thought that uh, dragon bones were most efficacious. And it was believed that when a dragon shed its skin, it didn't just shed the skin, it would shed the bones as well, and these would fall to earth and turn to stone. And there are books that, are, are, that very carefully how to explain how you have to take these out of the earth. Uh, they should never be um, dug up by women or they will lose all of their power. Only men were allowed to dig them up. Uh, the yellow coloured bones were more potent than the black bones and they were generally ground up and um, drunk as a potion. That is the front leg of a sauropod dinosaur. Not, they're the long-necked herbivorous ones. Uh, that's not a particularly large one. There's a burgeoning amount of evidence now that the biggest sauropod dinosaurs were considerably bigger than the blue whale. You'll hear people say that the blue whale is the biggest animal that ever lived. Well, it's looking like uh, the biggest dinosaurs eclipsed them. There was one called Amphicelius, which had vertebral discs 10 feet across. Now, imagine the size of the animal, even if it's long and thin, that, um, that had vertebral discs that size. It's estimated to have been about 220 tonnes. So that's at least 30 tonnes heavier than a blue, the biggest blue whale. And uh, the familiar Brontosaurus, you all, you all have heard of Brontosaurus, I have a theory about Brontosaurus, and that is that all Brontosauruses were thin at one end, very, very much thicker in the middle, than thin at the other end again. <laughs> but you can imagine if uh, <coughs> people would turn up <coughs> the skull or, or teeth of something like a Tyrannosaurus rex, it would be quite terrifying, and they would, they would imagine these uh, awful, ferocious creatures of godlike power. And the original dragons weren't just big lizards, they were gods. They were literally gods with godlike powers. <clears throat> but many, many uh, texts speak of humans and dragons interacting. So you can't really interact with a load of fossilized bones. So these texts clearly, clearly state 
people meeting these creatures. And this is both, both in the West and uh, in other areas as well. A lot of the old British dragon legends, when you read them, it's clearly an account, however garbled in the retelling, of an encounter with some sort of entity or creature. So let's have a look at sort of what living creatures <coughs> could be mistaken for dragons. This is a Indo-Pacific crocodile, also known as the saltwater crocodile, or, um, or uh, uh, estuarine crocodile. It's the biggest of all the crocodiles. It can grow to over 30 feet long and weigh about three tons. Its jaws here, this is not a particularly big specimen, that's the hand of a, uh, a keeper in an Asian zoo who got a little bit uh, too careless. Um, the jaws bite down with at least 10 times the force of a great white shark. A great white shark bites down with a force of something like 400 pounds per square inch. A big crocodile will bite down with a force of 5,000 pounds per square inch. It's like having a lorry uh, fall on you. Uh, in the northern uh, the northern part of their distribution in China, they were referred to as the flood dragon because it was believed that they would come into human habitations or human villages at times of floods. And they were believed to be intelligent and there are, there are records of, of proclamations being read out to crocodiles because it, it, it was believed that they were a primitive form of dragon. And these things can take down fully grown tigers, sharks, water buffaloes, and they are known man-eaters. There's one story from uh, the 1950s in Borneo where a, a rubber tapper called James Montgomery heard stories from a, a local tribe of this monster that lived along the river. And the locals thought it was the father of the devil and they would throw silver coins to appease it whenever it appeared, throw silver coins into the water. He went to look for it and found this monstrous crocodile on a sandbank and he realized his gun would do him no more um, good than a, a pea shooter. So he thought discretion was the better part of valor and he, he went away again. He came back the next day and measured the sandbank, and the sandbank was 30 feet, 30 feet long, and the end of the crocodile's tail was in the water, which would have made it at least 33 feet. There's another picture of a recently captured saltwater crocodile. It was the biggest one in captivity. It was just over 20 feet long, big, but no, uh, no record holder by any means. That's a Nile crocodile uh, of Africa. They can grow to over 20 feet. There's one in, uh, at the minute, a notorious man-eater in Malawi that's thought to be at least 23 feet long. Uh, it's liable that they max out around the 25 foot um, mark, so they're not quite as big as the saltwater crocodile, but they're even more aggressive, and they, they kill more humans e every year than any other species of crocodile. That wildebeest it's attacking there is about the size of a pony, so you get an idea of how big this croc is. They take down lions, uh, black rhinoceros, uh, young elephants, and uh, hi even hippopotamus. Gustav, this uh, absolutely immense man-eater, has been seen killing a fully grown hippo. About the only creatures they don't attack are full-grown elephants and white rhinoceros. That's a reconstruction of a 28 foot long crocodile that was shot uh, in 1957 uh, in uh, Queensland in Australia, uh, the largest one that was actually measured by an expert. And uh, that it was too big to save the, the carcass, but they, they made a scale, a fully one to one scale model of it. And that's uh, a six foot tall man, so you can get an idea of how big a really big crocodile is and how formidable. For years there were rumours uh, on a small chain of Indian islands of dragon-like creatures that, uh, that inhabited these remote islands and uh, one of the local Maharajas used to ban, banish um, criminals to this particular island where they would be torn apart by these legendary beasts. And it wasn't until uh, around about the time of the First World War that an aviator crashed on this island and found himself surrounded by huge lizards. And they were, of course, the Komodo dragon, the biggest known living lizard. They can grow to about 10 feet long. They have razor sharp teeth. They're a bit hard to see because they're quite small, but they're razor sharp and this massive gape here like this. And they will feed on uh, wild pigs, um, deer, water buffalo, and uh, fat fat Austrian bankers who wander off the path when they're on holiday in Komodo. 
Here are some Komodo dragons feeding on the carcass of a dead whale on the beach. <coughs> now, <coughs> not only have they got very sharp teeth, they've also got venom glands here. They're the biggest venomous animals in the world. And when you see them, they've often got um, great loops and strands of saliva uh, hanging from their, their jaws, a bit like me when I think about Winona Ryder. Um, and, and the saliva is venomous, so if they bite you and you get away from them, the venom uh, causes your flesh to rot and the creatures can smell you, they've got a wonderful sense of smell with their tongues and they can track you down and eat you. You might think they're formidable, they're nothing to their prehistoric relative. Megalania prisca lived on mainland Australia until about 10,000 years ago. It's known from fragmentary remains, uh, so we don't know exactly how big it is. Estimates range from 23 to 30 feet long and a couple of tons in weight. So if a Komodo dragon can tear you apart, imagine what this thing can do, the size of a bus. The creature it's attacking there is called Jenny Ornis, which, believe it or not, is a giant long-necked carnivorous duck. Uh, in the Pleistocene era in Australia, the wildlife was just bizarre. They had marsupial rhinos, they had flesh-eating kangaroos, they had giant kangaroos, monstrous snakes and a giant flesh-eating duck, and a giant crocodile called Quincana that galloped along on land like a horse. There's another picture of Megalania. <clears throat> there are rumours from New Guinea that Megalania or something very like it is still around. Uh, some fossil bones, uh, a, a part of a hip bone, was found uh, on mainland Australia uh, a couple of hundred years ago, and it seems to be sub-fossil. So uh, it's been examined by Professor Ralph Molnar, who says he thinks it's not a fossil at all, but much younger, and this thing could have been around very, very recently. And the Aborigines have in their, in their stories uh, that the Mungungali, or Goanna Bunyip, a giant terrible lizard-like creature. And in the jungles of New Guinea, there are, there are stories of monstrous lizards far bigger than the Komodo dragon. In 1960, uh, a number of these things were supposed to have come out of the jungle, rearing up on their hind legs like that, and killed a bunch of people, tore them to pieces. And a team from uh, Australia investigated these stories. They didn't see the lizards, but they saw their, the remains of their victims. And the, the local people were putting stockades around their um, villages to protect them. Uh, as recently as about 10 years ago, there were, there were stories of, of these things lumbering around in the jungles of New Guinea, which is one of the most unexplored places in the world. That's a skull of Megalania, and you can see the great teeth on it. Uh, its name means giant butcher, for obvious reasons. Monstrous snakes could be a good analogue for the worm-type dragons. This is a reticulated python. They can grow to about 33 feet long and they can swallow small bears and human beings. That is an anaconda, the largest, in terms of bulk, the largest living snake. They don't lay eggs, they give birth to live young. Uh, so they've broken their link with land and they spend most of their time in the water getting bigger and bigger. No one knows exactly how big they get, but there are reports of anacondas 50 to 60 feet long. Uh, in South America they're called Manatoro, the bull killer, because it was said that they could uh, grab a full-grown bull or a full-grown horse, constrict them and then swallow them whole. Another idea, uh, a, very, a very unique idea, was in this book. Flight of Dragons by Peter Dickinson. And he believed that dragons evolved from flesh-eating dinosaurs like Tyrannosaurus rex. And they flew, not with the muscular power of their wings, because they were too big and heavy, but by the manipulation of lighter than air gas in an expandable gut. He believed that uh, they had a chambered cow-like stomach that could expand, full of hydrogen gas formed from the hydrochloric acid in the stomach, together with the calcium of the bones of their victims. The wings were just used for steering. They're essentially fin-like structures used for steering. The lift was from the gas, and uh, they controlled the flight by burning it off like a living hot air balloon, and the fire could also be used as a weapon. Very interesting and unique idea, if ultimately unprovable. Maybe we're barking up the wrong tree, 
when we're thinking of dragons as purely physical flesh and blood creatures in the way that you and I are, in the way uh, you could go out and catch one and put it uh, on display at Paint and Zoo. Why have I got a picture of a yeti here? What's that got to do with dragons? Well, way back when I was hunting the Naga, I was looking at some statues in Thailand, which is nominally a Buddhist country, but they, ha they have this, this cross pollination from Hindus as Hinduism as well. And there were pictures of the, the, the Naga, the great crested serpent. There were pictures, the, and there were sculptures, rather, sculptures of the Naga, sculptures of um, the Singha, which is a mythical lion that's supposed to live in the jungle over there as well. And pictures of, and, and statues of Hanuman, the monkey god. And I was thinking, goodness me, I could be in Cornwall here because we've got the Naga, which is an analogue for Morgar, the great sea serpent that's reported around uh, the Cornish coast. Uh, we've got the Singa, which is a mystery cat, like the, the beast of Bodmin Moor and the beast of Exmoor. And we've got, um, we've got uh, the, uh, they also had the Garuda, which is a bird man, a creature half man, half bird. They had statues of this as well. And they've got the Garuda, which is uh, similar to the Cornish Owl Man. And the Cornish Owl Man is this weird creature that's been reported uh, in the woods near Mornan Old Church in Cornwall. And uh, a friend of mine is now a very well-respected scientist and refuses to speak about this. Now, he saw this as a youth in his, his teenage years, and he said, no, it wasn't an owl. It was some bizarre paranormal creature. Uh, it, it has owl-like wings and owl-like face, but it's huge, and it has weird claws and human-like features. And it's been seen a number of times. So I was thinking, hang on a minute. All these things are, are reported from Cornwall, and they're, they're in Thai culture as well. What's going on here? And then I add another bit of a thing. And I thought, there seems to be a global monster template. There are certain creatures you will find in all cultures all over the world. One of them are hairy giants like the Yeti, the Sasquatch, the Yeren, and so on. You find them everywhere, all over the place. In Europe, they would have been called trolls or wood -wozies. Little people, goblins, pixies, fairies, and so forth. Uh, duendes in Latin America, uh, Ibu Gogo in Indonesia. Black dogs, monstrous demonic dogs, found in cultures all over the world. This is a, a bargest or shuck from uh, one of the demonic bat dogs from British folklore, but you find them all over the world. Werewolves, hellhounds, all sorts of things. Monstrous cats. You get cat-like creatures in all sorts of cultures all over the world. That's one of the British big cats. I've actually seen one of those, so I know they exist. Monstrous birds. There's a thunderbird from um, Native American law. And you can think about the Roch, the Garuda, the Japanese Tengu, the Cornish Owlman. Again and again, the phoenix, monstrous birds. Why should we have the same monsters in every culture? And I had a bit of think about this and I came up with an idea. And of course, our old favourite, the dragon. Monster reptiles appear in every culture on Earth. This is one of our ancestors. This is an Australopithecine. And this Australopithecine and his family are knocking around on the plains of East Africa around about two million years ago, two to three million years ago. And they came down out of the trees to exploit a new food source on the, the newly formed grasslands. That was carrion. And they would, they would, they would feed on this high-protein carrion. They began to stand erect. But they had a very hard time of it. There's some more Australopithecines. They had a very hard life on the plains of East Africa. They would have been preyed on by crocodiles and pythons. They'd have been taken down by large birds of prey like the Marshall Eagle, and we know that from fossil skulls that have the claw marks in their heads. They would have been taken down by lions and leopards, African hunting dogs, and they would have been in combat and competition with other types of primate. There was not just one type of Australopithecine, there were a number of types of Australopithecine um, which were in, in, in competition with our own ancestors, some bigger, some smaller. That there is the skull of Dinopithecus, a giant baboon. It was almost as big as a gorilla. So it, 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 it occurred to me that all of these ancient monsters had analogues in the things that would have worried our ancestors. Could it be that we're dealing with some sort of gestalt thought form, thought form or tulpa? 
Are we familiar with thought forms? Are we familiar with tulpas? Does everyone know what tulpa is? Is that a yes or a no? A no. no, okay. Oh. A thought form. Um, the, well, the word tulpa uh, originates in Tibet, but this, this is another thing that's um, a quite widespread. It's an idea that under intense concentration, you can, with the power of your mind, make a 3D vis visible object or being. Almost like creating an artificial ghost with the power of your mind. And Buddhist monks in Tibet were supposed to be able to do this. Dame Alexandra Neal, you must have heard of her. She was a famous French woman, originally a singer. She travelled to Tibet uh, in the, in the uh, late 19th century, and early 20th century, and became a Tibetan Lama. A high priest, not a South American camel. Um, and, and she writes about creating a tulpa of a monk with the power of her mind. Over a period of about a year, she created this thing that was visible to other people. Uh, but then it started to struggle to independent from it, independence, and then she had imagined it as a chubby, happy-looking man, and this tulpa started to take on a sly, lean look, and she was felt it, it was pulling away from her and getting its independence, so she had to do another load of rituals to destroy it, and it took as long to destroy it as it did to create it. When I was a student in Leeds, I experimented with this. I experimented with tulpa creation over a period of two years. Managed to create a tulpa of an enormous spider in a cellar in my student digs in Leeds. And at one point I got about 30 people around this altar chanting the name of this fictional spider deity. And it looked like a scene from um, uh, the Doctor Who story, Planet of the Spiders. But I was successful in creating the tulpa of a spider that I saw myself and was, was um, felt by other people as well. But that's a whole different story. I could give a whole lecture on that because it's quite a weird and comical story. But if I go into that, we won't have time. But now you're sort of familiar with the, the vague idea of a tulpa. This guy here is a Polish medium called Franek Kluski. And in the, the, years, uh, the early years of the 20th century, uh, he specialised in manifesting animals at seances. Uh, he would manifest a huge bird that looks somewhat like a nightjar that would sit on his shoulders and his head. He manifested a great cat like a lion, a huge black dog, and a shambling ape-like creature that was strong enough to lift someone up while they were sitting in a chair. So it was almost as if he was tapping into the gestalt, unconscious mind of humanity and bringing these creatures up. Uh, he didn't manifest dragons, but I think that was because he was... Uh, indoors and they might, he might have been a bit big but it's weird that he was he was manifesting these creatures that seem to 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 be on the part of the uh, this template that's all over the world and uh, in muslim culture the jinn which are spirits said to be constructed of smokeless fire which you could in the, in the modern mind translate as energy uh, I've been told by, separately by two different Muslims that jinn take different forms. They can appear as great dragons or serpents, monstrous black cats, huge black dogs, monster birds and ape-like creatures. And again, there's the template. Good Lord. But maybe, so maybe on an on a unconscious level, under certain circumstances, these ancient prehistoric fears from our our subhuman ancestors come to the fore and we get creatures like this manifesting as physical beings for a short while that can interact in the physical world and leave traces. Now that's not to say there are not real yetis or, or, or real lake monsters or real big cats because I know there are. The yeti is, is, is almost certainly a, a species of gigantic ape but we get these weird Weird reports of, of Bigfoot and Yeti-like creatures in places that couldn't possibly support them, like Britain. So some of these may be, um, may be these strange gestalt thought forms. But we're being a bit arrogant here, I think, that, that we have to suppose that all of these are caused by us. Mankind loves to put a human face on everything. So maybe dragons and these other strange creatures are inhabitants of another plane of existence or another dimension. Um, theoretical physicists have postulated 28 different dimensions. And perhaps these dimensions are inhabited by creatures like dragons that can, on occasion, slip through to our world. Uh, there, are, there are stories of um, 
of, of people I've, I've heard um, slipping through and seeing um, gin in the world of the gin and seeing a gin funeral. And there's another one, another story of a man slipping through into the gin's world and seeing a gin as a tiny little child growing into an elderly man under a, a, a rose bush and then turning back into a tiny little child. So maybe these, these inverted commas spirit creatures or these, these legendary creatures are inhabitants of, this, of one of these other dimensions. My travels have taken me all over the world in search of strange creatures. Uh, I was in West Africa looking for a, a dragon-like creature called the Ninka Nanka, which is supposed to inhabit the swamps over there, and it, and it, it generates an immense amount of fear. Uh, people say if you see one of these things, you will die within five years, that they're bad luck, that you will die within five years, um, unless you get some sort of spiritual help if you see one of these creatures. And uh, everyone was terrified. Uh, we went out with an old man whose uncle had seen one. Uh, and he took us to this swamp where there was an abandoned village. And his uncle had seen this Ninkinanka. And the whole village was just abandoned. They, they moved out of the area because they were so scared of it. And th the descriptions were of a creature with a vaguely horse-shaped head, a great serpentine body, the fin or crest on the head, small legs, bat-like wings, and mirror-like scales. Uh, we met one man who had seen one of these creatures and uh, uh, believed he got a wasting disease from, from, from seeing it and um, had, to, had to go and see an imam, uh, a holy man, to, to get a cure. Then when we were in Mongolia looking for the Mongolian death worm, which is, again is another story, we heard stories of dragons which we're getting exactly the same description, the horse-like head, the fin, the long sinuous body, mirror-like scales, bat wings, forelegs, association with water. Uh, we heard of one uh, emerging from a well, coming up out of a well that was seen by an, an numerous people coming out, out from a well. And um, the, uh, the local communist party at the time, when it was still socialist, locked the well up after pouring oil down it, and the three men involved with it, uh, two died shortly after, and the other one was struck barren, according to this story, which happened in the 1990s. Um, even more recently, a man, uh, a doctor, a travelling doctor, went to draw water from a different well, a different part of, of the Gobi Desert, and, and said that he saw this immense creature coiled up in it with a horse-like face, fin on the head and limbs, and which was the description of a dragon. We get these same descriptions all over the world. The Naga, I, I went to look for the Naga, and once again I met many people that had seen the Naga. An old man had seen it when he was exploring some caves, and he, was, he saw this great sinuous creature coming out of an underground river, and exploring by candlelight, and he was terrified of it, but he thought afterwards, seeing it was a positive thing, because he, he got good luck afterwards. So, the dragon is many things. It's all these metaphors we've heard today as well, but behind that, there's something solid. So, when people tell you that dragons don't exist or they only exist in fairy tales, they're lying. People still see dragons today. The dragon is a very, very real entity and it's a complex tapestry of many, many things, but it exists. It's a real creature. of them are in France in early cave paintings from about 25,000 years ago. But there is an anthropologist called Dr. Uh, Jamie Torini from um, uh, the University of Durham and himself and his team have been studying the antiquity of legends and fairy tales and they've done it in the way that biologists study animals and the relationships, evolutionary relationships between animals. They call it the phylogenetic tree in biology and they've applied this to legends and fairy tales. And they found that some of the, the best known legends like uh, Sleeping Beauty and Rumpelstiltskin go back much further than we thought, thousands rather than hundreds of years. And there are legends all over the world of uh, a cosmic hunter 
pursuing an animal across the sky and the animal is bleeding and the blood becomes the stars and this is found in many many cultures and it goes back thousands and thousands of years and he's traced the origins of the dragon legends back to Africa before modern man left Africa let that sink in a minute before we left Africa over a hundred thousand years ago and these ancient African dragons were thought of as serpentine, horned, and living in and around water and having power over water. So remember water, that's the ancient element most linked with dragons. And we'll be coming back to that again and again and again. And echoes of these ancient dragons are found in, in more recent dragon mythology in Africa, in things like Inkanyamba, um, the sky dragon that brings rain, and Nyame, the dragon of Lake Kariba. But back to the Western Dragon. It uh, spat fire from a uh, dragon or dragon-like creature in the UK is the worm uh, called the Orm in Germanic countries or the Lindorm in Scandinavian countries. And this was essentially an outsized serpent. It had no limbs whatsoever. It was a huge snake-like beast. And rather than breathing fire like a true dragon, it spat venom or it belched great clouds of venomous gas and uh, if it was hacked into pieces, it could join back together again. Uh, the, the best known uh, example is the Lampton Worm up uh, near Durham, which terrorised uh, terrorized the county in the 11th century until it was killed by Sir John Lampton, uh, who fought the beast in the middle of the River Weir with uh, armour studded with uh, spearheads. So when the worm crawled about him, it impaled itself on on these uh, spikes and John Lampton could hack it to pieces and the pieces were washed away by the current of the weir before they could grow back together again. In Scandinavia where they're called Lindorms it was often thought that um, they would uh, grow from ordinary snakes and just get bigger and bigger and bigger until they lived in lakes to support their weight and then finally they get so huge that they would go out to sea and become sea serpents and they would be thought to coil around churches and crush them and the way to fight a, a Lindorm in Scandinavia was to breed a giant bull. And you would raise a bull by uh, feeding it nothing except milk. So you would never wean it, according to legend. And the bull would get bigger and bigger until it was the size of an elephant. Then the two creatures would fight. And the Lindorm would often swallow the giant bull and get fatally stabbed by its horns internally. And both creatures would die. The basilisk, which jaws. It had invulnerable scales. Uh, they were highly intelligent. They weren't just outsized flying lizards. Uh, many of them had magic powers. The, the green dragon of Long Witten could become invisible. Many of them could self-heal wounds. Uh, some of them were functionally immortal. And a lot of them could shape change. And uh, the Western dragon is invariable, invariably malevolent. Uh, it uh, laid waste to the countryside, uh, devoured men and animals. Uh, strangely, in British dragon legends, it very rarely hoards gold, and in a lot of them, there's no hero that comes and saves the day. The dragon just appears, terrifies a community, then disappears again, rather like reports of mod uh, modern day reports of, of mysterious animals who appear, terrorize a, a community, and then disappear again. Uh, when the dragon is slain, more often than not, it's uh, by a peasant rather than a nobleman and or, or sometimes a whole community gets together to, to drive the dragon away. Let's take a look at another picture of a typical western dragon. There we have four legs, two wings, reptilian. All dragons are reptilian. They do not have mammalian features whatsoever. Now that's a wyvern. See the difference? Only two legs and two wings. Wyverns were much smaller than dragons. Uh, some of them bore a scorpion-like sting in the end of the tail, and they were thought to bred, um, uh, <coughs> spread plague and disease. So if there was an outbreak of plague, it was oftentimes blamed on the wyvern. But remember, two legs for a wyvern, four legs for a dragon. Another very common... Richard Freeman. I work for an outfit called the Centre for Fortean Zoology, which is a unique organisation, and we study mysterious, strange and anomalous animals. Uh, I travel around the world searching for creatures like the Tasmanian wolf, a flesh-eating marsupial uh, that resembles a wolf, 
but with the stripes of a tiger and is supposed to be extinct but no one's told the Tasmanian wolf because uh, there's been over 4,000 sightings of it. Other creatures like the giant anaconda, the yeti and many many more. But one of my tr chief interests is dragons and I'm l interested in the literal existence of dragons. All of the talks today have been about dragons as symbols or metaphors or allegories. In order to have uh, a metaphor, you have to have something to compare it with. You can't uh, liken something to something you don't know about. For instance, uh, you might say that someone is as strong as a lion or as fierce as a lion, but you have to have the lion to compare it to. So it is my contention that dragons are actual entities. And in this talk, um, I want to give you a quick introduction to the, some of the different types of dragon found around the world in different cultures. Obviously, I can't do all of them, or we'll be here all week. Uh, then I will have a quick look at what might be behind the dragon legends, what could have influenced uh, these cultures all over the world to believe in these creatures. And then finally, I'll, uh, I'll tell you about some of the modern day dragon sightings because surprisingly there are quite a few claimed sightings of dragons in the modern age, particularly from Asia. And uh, I've talked to people all over the world who have encountered creatures whose descriptions are exactly the same on one side of the world to the other. So, let's get started with various types of dragon. Now this is the true dragon, or western dragon, sometimes called the heraldic dragon. Uh, it's the most formidable of all of the dragons. And as you can see, it has four limbs, there are four legs, and two leathery bat-like wings. Now, uh, in many modern representations in Hollywood films, the lazy filmmakers don't give it these front limbs which technically makes it not a dragon at all, but a wyvern. Now this annoys me far, far more than it actually should. Uh, in fact, it makes me seethe with rage. I, I came out of um, Peter Jackson's artless, witless bastardization of The Hobbit with the veins in my head standing out. Every drawing Tolkien ever did of Smaug the Golden showed him with four legs and two wings. And he was golden, not that muddy brown. In the film we're left with something that looks rather like a giant plucked turkey. <laughs> the best screen dragon was actually in the, the BBC TV series Merlin. If you remember that, they actually got the dragon fairly accurate in that. Anyway, the most formidable of all, cre of, of all of the dragons. The dragons go back an incredible, incredible way into antiquity. Uh, the earliest represent